I'm going to go ahead and get started here. My name is Aisha. I am the Congresswoman's Press Secretary. Thank you so much for being here with us. And Reverend Warnock, thank you for being here with us as well. We're super excited to have you. I'm going to keep it brief on my end. I know you all did not come here to hear me speak. So I'm going to go ahead and kick it off to the Congresswoman. But thank you so much, Aisha. And uh, I'm so excited for everyone that's joining us this evening. And thank you so much on a Friday evening at that uh, joining us. And my name is Lucy McBath. I'm the uh, representative for Georgia's 6th Congressional District. And before we get started, as I do before every event, I really want to thank every single person that is on this call. Uh, thank you for joining us. Fi thank you for finding this moment as important to you as it is to make sure that uh, you are getting to hear from my phenomenal uh, friend, Reverend Warnock, soon to be my colleague in Washington and myself, as we really try to, as I would say, galvanize the troops for some of the most important elections that we will have in our lifetime. Uh, whether you are joining us by social media or uh, by email, or you uh, were told by a friend to come join us this evening, thank you so much. I'm so happy to honor, I mean, so honored to actually host you this evening. Uh, and of course, a very special thank you to Reverend Warnock. I'm honored to be with you today, and I look forward to having you serve with us in Washington, uh, uh, in the United States Senate. And as I said, boy, oh boy, oh boy, just you wait till you get there. <laughs> but thank you for standing up and fighting in times such as this. You are uh, really, really going to make this country much stronger and a better place. And I know that you are ready for a time such as this. Um, Reverend Warnock, did you want to just say a little something about yourself? Wonderful. Thank you so very much, Congresswoman. It's wonderful to be here with you. And um, I'm grateful for your leadership, which began certainly before you went to the U.S. Congress. It's really your leadership and your passion and the ways in which you've transformed um, your own loss and pain and the power in order to empower others that is taking you to this moment uh, at this time in our country. And so I'm, I'm deeply hopeful to be able to join you um, on the, the Senate side so that we can get into some good trouble uh, together. I'm Raphael Warnock and uh, for those who are with us tonight and um, I grew up in public housing down in Savannah, Georgia, one of 12 children, I'm number 11, the baby next to the baby. I'm the first college graduate in my family. And for the last 15 years now, I've served as senior pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church. Uh, it may seem a little strange to some folk that a pastor would be running for the U.S. Senate. Uh, but for me, um, my sense of the values that transcend from my faith uh, have always driven me uh, into the streets and into the suites. I don't feel like my influence ends at the church door. That's where it starts. And so that's caused me to stand up for health care reform in our state. And uh, I've been fighting for health care, health care for all, because I believe health care is a human right for years. I'm deeply concerned that we have um, over 500,000 Georgians in the Medicaid gap here in Georgia, people who are uncovered that could be covered. I'm concerned about the 1.8 million Georgians who have pre-existing conditions who, if it were left up to your colleague in the Congress, Doug Collins, who wants the same Senate seat I'm running for and left up to Senator Leffler, who's in that seat, uh, they would be left uncovered. And so this is the work I've been doing for years, health care, voting rights, criminal justice reform, uh, climate change, human sex trafficking, a range of issues. And I'm hoping to transform my uh, work of agitation as an activist into legislation and to represent the people of the great state of Georgia in the United States Senate. Well, thank you. So just tell us a little bit of, how's it going on the campaign trail? Well, uh, I don't know that I have much to compare it to. I've supported uh, candidates in the past, but I'm a first time candidate. And I'll tell you, Congresswoman, I, I entered this race uh, on January the 30th. And uh, by that time, we were starting to hear some whisperings about some virus, maybe that may have been headed this way. But like most citizens, I didn't know much about this at all. And um, 
six weeks after I got into the campaign, we were in the middle of this COVID-19 challenge. And so uh, I had six weeks of the old norm, normal. And like all of us, I've been campaigning in this brave new virtual world ever since. Uh, and doing some in-person campaigning also, but obviously it requires a lot of logistical planning uh, because the most important thing for us is to keep pe people safe. So even as we've done that, um, I think we have great momentum in my campaign. I got in 30 days into the first quarter, I outraised everybody in this race. <clears throat> and um, we, uh, I was really clearing my throat. I, that wasn't for effect, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I already. That's okay. I, you can applause <laughs> from me. Applause, applause, applause. Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> I outraised everybody in the race, and uh, we've continued to do that ever since. Uh, we doubled what we did uh, in the first quarter, second quarter, and uh, we're humming right right along this quarter. Uh, I've, I'm honored to receive the endorsements of every member of our, every Democratic member of our congressional delegation, uh, including uh, uh, Congresswoman Lucy McBath, uh, the late Congressman John Lewis, Hank Johnson, Sanford Bishop, David Scott have all endorsed me. Um, and I have the endorsements of uh, your colleagues in the Senate, some 31 sitting United, Senate, United States senators have looked at the work that I've been doing for years as a citizen, bringing people together to fight for these issues. And they've said, this is somebody who uh, we certainly would view as a peer and who could work alongside us in the Senate. So 31 sitting US senators have endorsed me, including um, Kamala Harris, who is our nominee for the vice presidency uh, and everybody else who ran for president um, um, this year on our side. Uh, among the senators and also Mayor Pete. Uh, I'm also uh, endorsed by every, almost every Democratic member of the state legislature. Uh, and uh, of, course, of course, I have the, the Democratic coalition behind me, labor, women, the Brady Pack. Um, the uh, NRA gave me an F the other day. I was, I was, dis I was disappointed. Um, I was wondering what took them so long. And uh, <laughs> we're going to continue to fight the good fight, Lucy McBath. I can't wait to get there with you uh, so we can pass more uh, some common sense gun legislation and um, create uh, the beloved community, uh, one that honors your son uh, and all that he represented and so many uh, uh, people who have senselessly died uh, uh, to gun violence in this country. But the campaign is going great and, and I'm, I'm encouraged. We got some information in, in, in recent polling. We just got on television, by the way, uh, about a month ago, and we're seeing the polling numbers move, move very significantly. And so I'm running neck and neck with the two Republicans in this race. Well, I venture to say that you're going to be outrunning them. Oh, That's absolutely. Not, <laughs> not running neck and neck, you're outrunning them. Absolutely. So, well, I'm so so grateful once again that, that you're with us this evening and thank you for keeping us abreast of what you've been doing. Of course, you know, we're both running our own separate races and it's kind of, you know, different to keep, it's kind of difficult to keep track of what anyone else is doing in any of the other races because we're so just really late focused on our own races, but thank right. you so much for that update. And, um, you know, um, I just, once again, I really want to thank you for standing up and, you know, it was a, it was a, a, a big decision to stand up and to run for the Senate seat. Um, and I know it takes a lot of courage and a lot of fortitude to do that, especially on the state level, because I mean, I mean, you have the entire state that you're trying to galvanize and support. And so thank you so much for your courage and your strength and your determined determination to do that. We really, really need that. Um, you know, and, and I guess I probably say this at every single event, but I really mean it. I mean, I, I really mean that um, 
I, I really believe that all of our supporters, your supporters, my supporters, Carolyn's supporters, John's supporters, all of our supporters, you know, we're all one big family. We're all on one ticket. And so I could not be more grateful than to be with every one of you, with you, Reverend Warnock, uh, on the ticket. Um, it really means a lot to me. It shows the, the completely different dynamics, the shift in dynamics of our politics here in Georgia, right. uh, you know, that you were running for Senate. And that, you know, I'm the first minority in the history of Georgia to ever hold this congressional seat. I mean, so mm -hmm. things are really, really shifting and changing here in Georgia. And so I do see all of us running together on this ticket as one family, one unit, because we have to be that way in order to make sure that we're all crossing the finish line together. Um, and, you know, I know that none of the work that I do is any different than what you are doing. Um, you know, we're all doing the same kind of work, just in different veins. We're all on the campaign trail and everything that each of us does makes it more possible for all of us to be supported and for all of our volunteers and people on the ground to help support what we're doing collectively, because that's really what's going to get us to the finish line in the end. And everyone on this call, you already know that um, the time for us to stand is right now. I mean, <laughs> the time for us to stand is right now. And our nation is facing um, some of the most troubling times that we've ever seen in our history. I don't think any one of us has, has ever imagined that we would come to this point uh, in our democracy. Each uh, new event that we've seen, each new shooting that we've seen, each new act of violence that we've seen over the last several months now is a painful reminder to me of everything that I know that I've experienced in my life with the own tragic uh, murder of my own son in Jacksonville, Florida. So uh, like uh, so many other grieving parents, black parents across the country, you know, I grieve with America every single day. Uh, every time we see another instance of violence, not just only on black America, but all of, uh, you know, the black and brown bodies around the country. And, you know, I lost my child for reasons um, that were completely beyond my control. People are losing their lives every single day to uh, unnecessary violence that is completely beyond their control. And, you know, it, it just hurts me. It, it really hurts me to my core because I was born in the civil rights movement as Reverend Warnock, you were too. You know, and I, my father fought as Illinois branch president of the NAACP. He, he, he was the president of the Illinois branch uh, of the NAACP for over 20, over 20 years, served on the executive board. And I, and I joke and I laugh and I say with people that the first song I really knew by heart was We Shall Overcome. It's because that was in, that was in my soul, in my spirit, that's in my DNA. And so fighting for people's civil and human rights, for, fighting for uh, civil justice, human rights is really what this work is all about. Why we go to Washington, we are going to Washington to make sure that we are protecting everyone's civil and human rights for the democracy that this constitution says they should be afforded. Uh, you know, and so we each have had, um, I know that you, uh, Reverend Warnock, have had great uh, responsibility for the work that you do at Ebenezer Baptist Church, you know, because of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, you hold a, a great responsibility. You hold the mantle now. And so I know that it, it grieves you as well to see that we're disturbingly kind of slipping back in time. And I know that's also a reason why you've decided to throw your hat in the ring because there is so much at stake. Um, you know, I was a baby when John Lewis and Dr. King uh, marched on Washington. Uh, but today I do get to serve alongside, I did get to serve alongside Congressman John Lewis. What the, what an honor. I used to pinch myself on the floor all the time when I would speak with John or he would give me advice or he would, you know, encourage me uh, or he would walk with me on the floor. We'd sit together on the floor. We'd walk over to Mitch McConnell's office when we wanted him to pass federal background checks for all gun sales, just to be able to really work with some of the most um, just, uh, you know, uh, just people that I have admired all of my life that were really in the trenches. And I just can't tell you how much that means uh, to me to continue to be able to fight for some of the same kinds of uh, policies that my father and my mother fought for. And, uh, you know, but I, 
I think we're finding ourselves no longer just really marching to that triumphant course of we shall overcome, mm. um, but that angry rhythm, you know, of people, of a race of people now, the country crying out because, you know, when there is no justice, there's no peace for all of us, not just for Black America, but for all of us that are suffering under this administration and the policies. So America's moral conscience to a race of people, all of us that are so really woven into the fabric of this nation, you know, and to have this administration continue to fan the flames of systemic racism, bigotry, you know, is it's really rearing its ugly head over and over again. We've got to stand up against that. We've got to stand in the gap. So, you know, we're, we're really faced now with the dangerous resurgence of those voices in Washington and across this country that are sowing division and hate. And, and my friend, Reverend Warnock knows, you know, that I'm deeply religious as just as he is. And according to our faith, you know, according to our faith, you know, to fear or to vilify or to murder anyone as a direct contradiction to the word of God. And so that is why we choose to serve you know, and those who walk with us, you know, you know, where's the heart of man when, you know, he, man chooses to desecrate the commitment to living one nation under God. That's what this administration is doing at this point. You know, I always ask, what God are they serving? What God do they serve? So, you know, I, I find it, you know, worthy that, you know, my friend Reverend Warnock and I are choosing to serve. I find it worthy to serve, you know, humankind. And yes, all lives do matter, but we know specifically that does not negate the black lives that really, really matter because of disproportionately what's been happening in the country. And so, um, you know, as we've seen across the country, a lot of what's, ha what's happening, what happened to my son is not unique. And we've got to work together to build an America that holds in high regard life for every human being. And in that, that's on all of us. That's on all of us. And that's why we stand together. So I implore everyone that is on this call today to please remain committed uh, to uh, what has uh, transpired in the past, the work that's been done by people that preceded us in the past, what we do tomorrow, what we do this week and this month, please stay committed and stay engaged. Um, you know, Reverend Warnock and I, we know what it's like to commit yourselves, you know, to something that's more fair or more just for a safer and a better country. And so thank you so much, all of you for being with us tonight to help us do that. And uh, we really, mm -hmm. really appreciate you. We really do. Um, so Absolutely, with <laughs> absolutely. So with that, I think I am. Um, so, so as your transfer, let me let me. I saw in the chat someone asked specifically about this race, and I wanted to answer because I don't. Uh, hopefully, folks will stay with us the whole time. But uh, someone said that the uh, let me that he was a that they were an early supporter, and they were wondering why uh, they didn't see um, my name. Uh, in the primary ballot in uh, Clarkston. That's right, that's BLA Barclay. Thank you so much. Very, just very quickly, uh, there are two Senate races in Georgia. I'm running in the special election. And so there was no primary in my race. Uh, all the Republicans and Democrats in my race will be, and in the, whoever else, uh, uh, will be on the ballot for the first time November uh, 3rd. And, um, I plan to win on November 3rd, but uh, if I don't pull it off, or pull it out November 3rd, uh, we'll go to a runoff. The two top vote getters, whoever they are, Democrat, Republican, will go to a January 5th runoff. So I want to clarify that uh, for the person uh, I saw that in the chat. Thank you, Congresswoman and Reverend Warnock. We're actually going to go ahead and hop into the questions. We have a few video questions from the audience, and we're going to play them right now. Our first question. Video questions.
I think we're having some uh, diff technical difficulties, so I'm just going to go ahead and ask it out loud. Um, this question is from is to Representative Macbeth and Reverend Warnock. The question is, there are so many things happening right now and it's very overwhelming and hard to stay focused. How do you stay focused on getting things done in this environment? Reverend Warnock, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna defer to you, Congresswoman. Uh, I, listen, I, um, I stay focused by making sure that I attend to the thing that centers me at the beginning of my day. And so my days begin really focused on spirit and body, body and spirit. My days begin with uh, prayer and quiet time, uh, the kinds of things that, that feed the, the spirit and, uh, and with the exercise and working out. And I find that um, if you don't get those things, at least for me, if I don't get them in or first thing, if I don't prioritize those things, then other things uh, get in the way and uh, you end up putting those things on the back burner. And so that centering of body and spirit is helpful to me. And um, so that as other people try to prioritize my day, I'm really clear about what I'm about and what my agenda is. I think if you don't have an agenda, someone will give you one. And so, uh, and sometimes uh, when you are a person who is guided by purpose, you will find that purpose is sometimes offensive uh, because you're really clear about, it's not that you aren't open, you're, clear, you're clearly open and talking to other people is a part of understanding one's purpose as you move forward. Um, but uh, just being, being very clear, and, and these are the things that keep me grounded and and talking to people who are sources of wisdom uh, that I admire uh, and respect. So when folks ask me, you know, how are you doing this? You know, you're launching a campaign. No, I'm continuing a campaign. I'm on the same campaign. I've been fighting for these issues for years. And this is just a new um, uh, way of doing the work that I've been trying to do for years. Um. <laughs> Much like you, Reverend Warnock, you know, um, I spend a lot of time praying, a lot of time praying. Um, what helps me focus is when I'm not in Washington in particular, when I'm home here, when we've been home much of the time, and I'm in a sense kind of grateful for that because it has allowed me a sense of freedom to be able to really stay focused and to really um, just keep building my relationship with God. I, I, I walk my dog every morning and I'm praying to God as I'm walking my dog. Um, I'm on a number of prayer text chains. There are people that I pray with. There's meditationals that I'm reading and scripture that I read every single day. I listen to Charles Stanley every single day um, because I know that um, these are some very, very difficult times. And and, and I view everything that's happening here as a spiritual battle. I really, really do. And so that is the way I tackle it. And I'm always calling on God, asking for his wisdom and for his strength, um, you know, and guidance, guidance that I'm not making decisions that are against his will. But also, too, I'm, you know, it keeps me focused on my goals or, you know, seeing so many people like the people that are on uh, with us this evening. Um, you know, standing up for what they believe in, fighting and advocating for change. Uh, I'm humbled every day by my own team and my staff and volunteers that are right alongside me, just really fighting for what, what they believe in. And so I know if they're fighting that hard and they're investing in me and my vision for Georgia, then I have to be right alongside them and fighting just as hard. So I know that we're all fighting to improve this country and I'm really humbled uh, by the hardworking Americans that I get a chance to talk to every day, that I get to, to see every day, that it really are hoping that, um, and still believing in that sense of um, um, that great American dream and that democracy that everyone uh, kind of sees slipping away under this administration. And so what gives me hope is that each and every day I can get up and I can um, follow the path that God has given me. And I really pray that I'm um, 
keeping my vision expanded and open to what he's calling me to do for his people. Thank you both for that. We're gonna go ahead and go on to the next question and we're gonna try the whole video question thing out again. <laughs> If it's not working, we can go ahead and I can ask the next question. How to give it another try. <laughs> so this question is to Reverend Warnock and Representative Macbeth. Georgia is undoubtedly a battle, battleground state. Reverend Warnock, what is your campaign doing on the front lines to flip the entire state? And Representative Macbeth, what does your election say about our ability to flip the entire state? Well, thank you so much. And, and uh, Aisha, no, no uh, worries here. Technology is here to keep us all on our toes. <laughs> what would we do with it and without it? Um, so um, listen, Georgia is not a battleground state. Georgia is the battleground state. And uh, we are going to flip this uh, state. We're going to flip the Senate blue. And we're going to... Um, change our country uh, and extend the promise of our democracy to all of our people. Um, we have uh, witnessed the change of the state over time. I found uh, the turnout during the June 9th primary uh, to be very encouraging. We had record turnout. There were a lot of national stories about the voter suppression and that's real. Uh, but what got lost in all of the national stories about voter suppression is that Georgia uh, Democratic voters had record turnout. 1.3 million Democrats uh, showed up and uh, less than a million Republicans. And so the wind is at our back. The momentum is with us. The other side knows it. That's why they're playing games. And so what is my campaign doing? We're telling people to think about voting as a toolkit. Uh, you don't need to just focus on one method of voting. We need to focus on all of them. And so if you can, uh, we're encouraging you to vote by mail. Vote by mail is safe, um, it's dependable. You, you have a record, you have a record of, of how you voted and um, anybody in the state of Georgia can vote by mail. So uh, that's one positive thing about the voting laws here in Georgia, anybody can vote by mail. So we wanna push that and encourage people to do it. We also had a, a, a ruling by a judge that said that if you're, look, I'm not asking you to, don't wait until the last minute, but I am grateful for the decision from the judge a few weeks ago that said, if your uh, vote by mail ballot is postmarked by the day of, a, of, by election day, they have to count it. So there are good reasons to vote by mail, but if, if that doesn't work, if you run into a snag or an issue there, you might, um, you know, you, uh, the other thing is you can, you can request your ballot, by the way, online. But if for some reason you can't vote by mail, uh, you can also uh, vote early uh, in person. And then, I, and then election day, I think should be the last resort, should be the last resort. We really should spend election day getting the people who haven't voted to the polls. Go ahead and get your vote out of the way and then spend the, spend the days leading into election day and election day, making sure that everybody is, uh, is already gone to the polls. And so my campaign is pushing that message and I think the most important thing that I can do as a candidate to get people out to vote is to give them something to vote for because people don't vote for politicians, they vote for themselves. And so I'm, I'm saying the students, that student loans are on the ballot, the Pell Grant is on the ballot, uh, healthcare is on the ballot, uh, the whole planet <laughs> and its health and its future is on the ballot and God knows that the soul of our democracy uh, our systems that have held this democracy in place, the checks and balances, all of those things are on the ballot. And um, we say every cycle that elections have consequences. I think in the midst of this global pandemic, as we've witnessed the terrible mishandling of it by leadership in Washington and from the, uh, the governor's mansion, uh, we have seen in ways that are just too painful that elections actually 
are a matter of life and death. So tell everybody you know in, the, in, in your circle that they must vote. Uh, that is a, it's a very thoughtful question. Thank you for that question. And I think the things that um, dynamically we're seeing a shift in Georgia, the fact that I actually hold the seat that was once held by Newt Gingrich should let people know that <laughs> things are definitely changing in Georgia. And I think, you know, a lot of that has to do with it. The people are looking for someone that they believe really believes in the same moral values and ideals and and really looking for people that they believe will stand up and champion for them in Washington. And, uh, you know, the truth is every single person <laughs> deserves to be able to vote, too. You know, and then when we do that, we win. And the political wins in Georgia are definitely, they're changing for a far more diverse and inclusive uh, kind of vision, which I think just really kind of helps solidify who we are becoming as the new South. We have so many people that are migrating here from all over the United States. And when they come, they come with their own experiences, their political ideologies, their religious upbringings. They're bringing all of that with them. Uh, all that makes them whole, they're bringing all those experiences here. And as I've said over and over again, that I really believe that the Atlanta metropolitan area, especially now because we have Hartsville Jackson International Airport, we are a global gateway. So people are coming here to go elsewhere and people are actually staying here. And I think after the 1996 Olympics, we really saw a huge growth exponentially in the Atlanta metropolitan area. So with that change, the political construct and, and dynamics is changing as well. Uh, but you know, <clears throat> that's the reason why it's so important uh, for us to spread the word, spread the word, make a plan about how we're going to vote and make sure that we're in, in encouraging our friends, our family to be registered to vote. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of work to do in Georgia, and I'm proud of the work that, that I and my staff and my volunteers have done, but, you know, we still have a long way to go. And as Reverend Warnock says, you know, we've got to make sure that we are educating. We have to make sure that we're educating our voters. I think that right now is the key, educating our voters, making sure they understand what the, what the deadlines are for turning in their absentee ballots, you know, making sure that they vote, that they turn in those ballots early. Make sure they understand where their polling locations are, the polling hours are, you know, uh, and 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 have having them be prepared that in the event that changes are happening rapidly, if some of the polling stations are closed, you know, that they have access to real time information, a phone number, uh, you know, hotline number that they can call to get real time information so that our voters are prepared. Uh, and for any kind of uh, um, intrusion in their ability to vote, make sure that we're educating them that they are prepared, they are ready to exercise their right to vote. Um, you know, Georgia families are depending on people like Reverend Warnock. They're depending on him in order uh, to help us make sure that democracy works for everyone. And they're depending on me as well to make sure that we are continuing to really, um, um, really just be a baseline for what's really the best of America that we can be when we're making sure that our politics is representing representative of who we're supposed to be the best of America that we're supposed to be. Thank you both. And this third question is directed towards Reverend Warnock. Reverend Warnock, you've made healthcare a core component of your campaign. What do you plan to fight for in the US Senate? Oh, I, I plan to fight for health care. <laughs> uh, you, you fight for the things you, you've uh, been lifting up in the campaign. Listen, I, I believe that health care is a human right. And it is certainly something that the richest nation in the world can and should provide to all of its citizens. And we certainly shouldn't be talking about getting rid of the Affordable Care Act in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, but I'm literally running against two uh, folks in Washington uh, who are trying to do exactly that. Uh, Congresswoman Lucy McBath is a great example of how you can go to Washington and not become drunken by the wine of Washington. Uh, she has kept her feet grounded here in Georgia uh, and with the values of ordinary people. Kelly Leffler, who I'm running against, who's only been in DC in six months, has already clearly um, drank the Kool-Aid and uh, embraced all of it. 
Doug Collins no different. They want to get rid of the Affordable Care Act in the middle of a pandemic. And so we've got to stand up. But beyond that, we've got to see how we extend health care to more Georgians, uh, perhaps through the public option, for example, uh, is one thing that I'm certainly interested in. I'm interested in the dignity of work. It's a shame and it's a contradiction to call people essential workers while refusing to pay them an essential wage and provide for them essential benefits. <clears throat> and so I plan to stand up for workers uh, in the state of Georgia. And I stand to, I plan to stand up um, for our children. Uh, a young person's outcome should not be based on their parents' income. Our kids deserve quality schools, regardless of their zip code. And they deserve access uh, to a quality post-secondary education, whether that's at a four-year college or university or at a vocational or technical training. We've got to get our kids ready for the 21st century. And when they come out of school, they shouldn't be overburdened with student debt. Student debt in this country has now exceeded credit card debt and auto loans. And what that means is that not only are the dreams and the willingness of young people to take chances and start businesses, for example, the entrepreneurial vision that, that uh, young people might pursue. When you're young, you're aspirational, you, you dream big dreams. Uh, but if you're already loaded down with debt, if you're 22 years old and you're already carrying a mortgage before you even gotten a mortgage, uh, you might take a safer route. And I think that that has implications not only for that young person, but I think for the American economy. We need innovators. We need bold and creative thinkers. And um, we've got to find a way to make sure that the next generation <clears throat> is not burdened with debt and not burdened with our uh, refusal to address climate change uh, in this country. Uh, we've got to we've got to deal with this climate change is here it's now it disproportionately impacts um, communities of color um, there's a reason why black children have a higher incidence of asthma uh, growing up in the inner city um, the, the air we all need clean water and we all need clean air but over and over again we see that communities that are already vulnerable uh, become disproportionately impacted when these kinds of disasters occur, whether it's climate change or COVID-19. Um, and I would say, you know, I think if probably most of you may know that I am a two-time breast cancer survivor myself. So I've been in the healthcare spectrum. I, I have been a patient. Uh, and so I can tell you, you know, when you are a pre-existing condition, the last thing, uh, the first thing that's foremost in your mind is really being concerned about uh, your treatment and your care. Uh, you know, and in my case, you know, my mortality, that was twice. And the last thing I was really concerned about was how I was going to pay for my health care. But of course, that is always looming in the back of your mind. That's the reason why when I went to Washington, you know, because health care is very, very personal to me. And I do know that we've got, you know, over 300,000 people in our district that, uh, you know, are pre-existing conditions in the sixth and 45,000 of them are children under the age of 17. So I know mm -hmm. this is very, very personal to them as well. And that's the reason why when I went to Washington, I was very, very proud to have co-sponsored legislation, which actually passed through the house uh, and still sitting, you know, on, on the desk of Mitch McConnell but the legislation did pass in the House to lower the price of prescription drugs and also to make sure that people can afford their treatment, uh, special people, especially people like me with pre-existing conditions. And I understand that, you know, a healthy nation is a vital nation. A healthy nation is a, is a nation of people that live a good quality of life. And everyone deserves to have access to affordable hair, health, health care. I do believe in strengthening the, the Affordable Care Act. I do not believe in dismantling what millions of people now have had for the first time in their lives is access to health care. 
Yes, there are some things that we need to strengthen. Yes, there are some things that we need to do to tweak the ACA, but you do not dismantle the only viable means that people have uh, to have access to healthcare, specifically at a time like this with COVID-19, that this administration would try to dismantle the only means of care that people have, I find is unconscionable. So I will continue to fight for health care. I will continue to fight to make sure that everyone has access to affordable health care because I believe that is your human right. And I believe that Reverend Warnock and I are definitely on the same page on that one. Thank you, Congresswoman and Reverend Warnock. Our next question is also directed towards Reverend Warnock. How is your background as a pastor and activist re reflected in your campaign's organizing? I didn't hear that part of the question. Sorry, you would like me to repeat it? Yes. How is your background as a pastor and activist reflected in your campaign's organizing? Oh, I, I think that um, you have to try to embody the values um, that you want to put forth in legislation in your organization. And so I'm very proud of the team we've organized uh, to run my campaign. It's a very diverse team. Um, it is a reflection of Georgia and a reflection of America. And we're reaching out to everybody in this state. Like I'm not giving up on any voters. I, I want to talk to everybody. I'll tell you, I'll be honest, one of my biggest disappointments um, you know, regarding COVID is the inability to go out full throttle the way I, I really dreamed about doing when I decided to run. You know, I imagined myself moving throughout the state and um, talking to voters. And, you know, I'm a pastor, so that comes naturally. Uh, I'm used to preaching the sermon on Sunday morning and then hanging around and talking to parishioners. Uh, I'm used to visiting people in their homes, standing with them in their, uh, at their bedside in hospitals, sometimes with them in waiting rooms while they're having to make tough decisions about loved ones, accompanying them to court. Um, ministry really is about presence and there are a lot of things you do as a pastor but I don't know that there's anything more important than the ministry of presence. You don't always know what to do. You can't easily solve people's problems, but being there with folks uh, in their highest moments and their lowest moments is its own healing power. And um, you ask how this informs my work as a candidate. I think that um, in this moment in America, and in the world in which we're dealing with this global pandemic, we have to find ways uh, both interpersonally, but also certainly through our public policy to show up for one another, to be present. Uh, I may not be the one who's sick, uh, but if my neighbor uh, is sick, that has implications for me too. Uh, if I wasn't able to see that clearly before the COVID-19 challenge, certainly you ought to be able to see it now. Uh, in the midst of a global deadly pandemic, your neighbor coughs, that has implications for you. You should want that person covered. But not only that, you should want their child to have access to a quality education so that they can be a productive citizen and be a part of the great neighborhood and community. Uh, you, you should want all of that. Um, so that so that people just have a ladder, a way to um, improve and create for themselves the best lives that they can create. And so um, that whole ministry of presence is what I have tried to bring to the campaign. And on every question as a United States Senator in uh, that great deliberative body where um, our job is the people's business, whether the issue is healthcare or education or immigration, or climate change, or equal protection under the law for uh, people of color or for members of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, the fundamental uh, question, moral question I wanna ask myself and ask my colleagues is, what does it mean to be here in this moment and to show up for one another?
Thank you. And this next question is directed towards both of you. Representative Macbeth and Reverend Warnock, what can I do in my own capacity to combat the rampant voter suppression we see in the state? Um, well, that's a really wonderful question. And thank you for, for, for asking that because um, I'm sure that Reverend Warnock and I have probably given this a great deal of thought as probably all candidates in Georgia have at this point. Um, you know, unfortunately, voter suppression is a problem that, that we saw so vividly in our primary. And voters, voters were stuck in lines for hours. Uh, and, you know, I believe they were there until midnight. And many of the polling locations were closed and people were left without, you know, adequate polling machines to meet the demand of those that had come to exercise the right to vote. And, you know, every vote counts. Every vote has to be counted and everyone should be afforded the opportunity to exercise the right to vote. And that should not be made difficult, um, especially not in this day and time when you, you had, you know, the Voting Rights Act, of, you know, and, and all the other pieces of legislation and all of those that, that move mountains beforehand like John Lewis to make sure that everyone could exercise the right to vote. We should not be seeing this at this current day and time, uh, but we've got to continue to educate, you know, uh, those in our communities about absentee voting, as I said before, uh, and, and the process, how to vote in person. It's really important that we are educating people and letting them know what they need to do to protect their right to vote. Please be sure to encourage everyone to vote early. Please encourage people to go to the polls early if they're going to actually physically go. Tell them to go do it early. Uh, anything can happen at the last minute and you don't want to be stuck saying in hindsight, oh my gosh, I wish I had gone early enough. Uh, because historically, even within the state of Georgia, you know, there are different populations of voters that go early. And that can be a deciding and a determining uh, way to really turn an election around. We've seen that in other states. So please share with voters, uh, you know, early vote deadlines, guidelines, and every voter should have, as I was expressing earlier, you know, that hotline number, a voter hotline number in case they are posed with any kind of distraction or disruption or problem when they're actually, actually trying to vote. Um, we've got to make sure that we do that. I know that my, my legal team, I have a legal team after the primary election, I was very, very concerned about what we saw. And I know that the Democratic Party of Georgia is going way out of their way and have done a lot of really, really good work to protect our ability to vote as the DCCC has. But I have a le my legal team is working with the party and also the national groups to make sure um, that, you know, our, our, our vote is protected here in Georgia, because I just want to make sure that everything that, you know, my colleague John Lewis thought, fought for and so many of, of my colleagues that were there long before I got to Washington have given their lives for, I want to make sure that, 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 that people have that right. I actually co-sponsored a bill in Washington that helps to restore the Voting Rights Act and to ensure you know, that, that people are not gonna be facing these obstacles in exercising the right to vote. And actually, I, I actually put forward legislation myself uh, under HR1, it's the Elected uh, Officials Integrity Act of 2019. Uh, and that basically says that anyone that is any elected officials that are running for office, they're not allowed to run in elections that they actually oversee. They're not allowed to run in elections where there is a conflict of interest, as we saw with our gubernatorial election between Governor Kemp and Stacey Abrams. And so I want to make sure that this does not happen. And that's the reason why I put forth legislation on a federal level to help protect our elections from every level, federal, state, and local. So um, we are uh, certainly in a stronger position than we would be in if Congresswoman Lucy McBath wasn't there doing the work that she does. And so the first thing you've got to do to help with voter suppression is you've got to make sure she returns to the Congress. 
uh, where she can continue to put forward the kind of legislation necessary to strengthen uh, our voting rights and to protect our voting rights. And you gotta send me to the United States Senate uh, because uh, the House passed the Voting Rights Act, which was last passed in 1996 uh, when uh, George Bush uh, was the president. And um, we, haven't, we haven't seen it passed since. Uh, passed 96 uh, to zero. And so I'm sorry, 2000, uh, 2006, uh, when George W, when George Bush was president. And so the Voting Rights Act passed the House. Where is it sitting? On Mitch McConnell's desk. And I'll have to tell you, um, I saw Mitch McConnell stand in the Capitol a few feet away from John Lewis's coffin as John Lewis laid in state. And um, he spoke very eloquently about John Lewis, called him a man of integrity and honor. And I'll have to tell you, as a friend of John Lewis and as his pastor, I was annoyed um, because as he offered his pious platitudes in memory of John Lewis, Mitch McConnell knew that he was sitting on John Lewis's bill, which is his life's work. If, if you summarize what John Lewis is in two words, other than to say John Lewis, the only other two words you can come up with are, are voting rights. And uh, in terms of his work, that's his, that's his work. And it's sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk. So if you want to fight voter suppression, show up and vote again. I'm assuming the questioner does vote. And get everybody, all of your friends out to vote. Uh, and everybody in your family out to vote. If you're married, you know, and you have to make sure they show up to vote. All the single folk out there, if somebody asks you for, for your phone number, I guess we still do that. I don't know, chimes are changing so much. Tell them you'll, I'm, I'm showing my age now. Tell them you'll write it on the back of their voting card <laughs> because you don't date people who don't vote. Uh, we don't hang out people with people who don't vote. We vote. Um, uh, but seriously, it's, it's really important um, because the ultimate goal of voter suppression is to so demoralize the electorate or parts of the electorate that you don't even bother. And um, I'm worried that in some parts of our electorate, it may be working. Um, I'm hearing too many young people say their vote doesn't count, doesn't matter. And what difference does it make? I can't, I, I don't know how you could have lived through the last four years and still be asking what difference could, have, could it have made? I don't know, ask, ask the 200,000 American families of the 200,000 people who are dead right now from COVID-19. Donald Trump didn't create the virus, but he mishandled it in ways that, uh, certainly border on criminal, if not criminal. And uh, as a result of that, tens of thousands of Americans are dead that don't have to be dead. Uh, didn't have to be, uh, uh, be uh, didn't have to die. And so um, make sure you show up to vote. And um, one of the methods of voter suppression, by the way, is voter purging, uh, use it or lose it laws. So we used to say, registration, education, mobilization in terms of voting. Registration or education, registration, mobilization. We've had to add one more step, verification. If you have any question about whether or not you're still registered because people have been purged with a change of an address, they get married and through exact, I mean, there are all kinds of tricks that are being played. So, um, you might wanna to go to the Secretary of State's office and just verify that your registration is in place, that is intact. You don't wanna to get to the polls on election day uh, and have to straighten it out on that day. Um, so vote, 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 verify, and insist that everybody in your circle must vote. Uh, send Lucy McBath back to Congress, send me to the Senate, so that we can do better than even just passing the Voting Rights Act, but do everything that we can, same day registration, 
uh, create a unified national voting bill of rights uh, that understands that the strongest expression of a democratic republic is the people have spoken. And so we have to make sure that the people can speak. Thank you, Reverend and Congresswoman. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but Reverend, I'm going to pass it off to you um, in case you wanted to say a few closing words. It's a dangerous thing to ask the pastor to have the last word. Uh, you know, I might say the benediction, I might raise an offering. I think I will raise an offering. Uh, if you want to support my campaign, please go to warnockforgeorgia.com where you can give. No amount uh, is too small. And um, uh, we would appreciate your support. A lot of momentum behind this campaign. You can also volunteer uh, at warnockforgeorgia.com. And finally, I just want to say how deeply honored I'm, I am uh, to be here with Congresswoman Lucy McBath, for whom I have so much respect and regard. And um, she lives and embodies uh, what I try to preach about. She's a walk-in sermon. She took her pain and transformed it into power. And there's no more, no more eloquent witness of the resilience of, of an indomitable human spirit uh, in this moment with respect to issues that we're wrestling with right now uh, than Congresswoman Lucy McBath. So thank you for the honor of being here with you tonight. Well, thank you, Reverend Wardike. Oh my goodness. I'm really humbled that you would think that. And I guess and one thing I will say though, is that I've, I've always, you know, my biggest prayer has always been all of my life. And especially when Jordan was with me is that you know, no matter what we did, no matter how we lived our lives, that we would always live our lives the way God want, uh, was calling us to. And that when people saw us, uh, hope that they would see God, even if they didn't know God, they would want to know what it is in us uh, that it is that they see. And I hope that it will always be God. And I am serving God and, and by serving his people. So with that, thank you so much, Reverend Warnock. Really, really appreciate uh, this time that we've had together tonight. Thank you for everyone that has uh, taken your few moments on a Friday night to spend time hearing from the both of us. Please make sure that uh, you do everything that you can to support Reverend Warnock. Please make sure that you talk to your networks and your friends and talk to people statewide. Let them know how much is going on here in Georgia and that Georgia should be on their mind and that Reverend Warnock should be on their mind uh, as uh, one of the next senators of the United States uh, for Georgia. Uh, thank you everyone for being on this call. It's because of people like you that we are able to do what we do. And uh, we want to continue to, to provide safety and help for you. Uh, of course, we're always praying for you. Uh, we want to make sure, though, that you're healthy, safe, and prosperous. And remember, please remember, don't forget to exercise your right to vote. Take care and good night. Good night. <laughs>